So maybe <clears throat> we would start by turning toward refuge. Hmm? Usually we chant Sange Chodang Soki Chodnam La, but uh, I would just like us to think about refuge. In what do we take refuge? You see, there's really three levels of refuge. There's the outer refuge, which is in the Guru, the Buddha Dharma Sangha. The Guru is the Buddha manifesting in human form in order to teach us. So we think like that. You know, we take refuge in our Guru as Buddha. We take refuge in the Dharma, the teachings, and this path, and we take refuge in the Sangha, our spiritual community, without which we kind of don't have the support we need. You know, when we have a spiritual community and we can come together and practice, it's a real blessing. It's a real blessing. So this is our outer refuge. But our inner refuge is taking refuge in the mind of enlightenment. The mind of enlightenment. We say, you know, I want to become enlightened in order to benefit every living being. But what is that mind? What is that mind of enlightenment? Geshe Loden in his Path to Enlightenment, described the enlightened mind as a mind that is filled with the greatest, most far-reaching love, fused with wisdom and compassion, completely free of ignorant hatred, ignorant attachment, and ignorance itself. He called it an unstoppable wellspring of happiness, peace, and contentment filled with boundless joy and no limitations to create beneficial circumstances reflecting that joy. Wow. That'd be all right, eh? So we take refuge in that mind and in the path to that mind, which is seeing the true nature of that mind, seeing emptiness directly and to the Arya beings who have. And that's our, our inner refuge. But our ultimate refuge, the third level of refuge, our ultimate refuge is taking refuge with confidence that the very essence of our own mind is wisdom. The very essence of our own mind is empty, spacious, and pure from the beginning. It's like the open blue sky. And its nature is luminous clarity. So it's like a, it's spontaneous and it's unobstructed. It's like a clear mirror. So this clarity is, connotes an idea of being able to reflect whatever appears before it. But what appears before it does not obstruct it or harm it or impinge on it in any way. The clarity is there to receive whatever is appearing before it. And its energy or its manifestation is compassion. Unimpeded and all pervasive. If, in fact, I remember that, that inner, that ultimate refuge, if I remember the nature of my mind every day, it has a profound impact on what I'm thinking in the moment. If I'm able to remember that aspect of the mind, so if we take these three levels of refuge to heart, really fervently to heart, not just you know from the lips, we can easily chant the refuge prayer 
and not think about what the words mean in Tibetan. When I was in three-year retreat, I took a Tibetan course. For I took two six-week courses in Tibetan. So I learned the Tibetan alphabet. I really wanted to learn Tibetan. And I had the Tibetan uh, dictionary. And, uh, you know, it's very complicated to try to find the words. And what I learned was the benefit of understanding Tibetan, which I didn't learn. I know a few words. I couldn't. I couldn't devote the time at that time to really, you know, and I didn't have someone to talk to. So I, I didn't continue in that study. But I appreciate knowing the meaning of the words. And I also appreciate knowing the meaning of the English translations. So when we look at the translations of these prayers, actually looking at the meaning of them, whatever the prayer is, to really look at the meaning. And I keep a dictionary beside my seat. So I look up words to, to really kind of bring it home. So taking refuge like that, thinking like that, and thinking of our good fortune to having met this path. Wow. The causes it is said, of having met the Dharma and having an interest in the Dharma and actually practicing the Dharma is that we have the two causes, it says, are pure prayer and pure morality, or and the rest. It says pure morality and the rest, which means the six perfections. So I look at my life, this life, and I think, am I creating the cause through the power of pure prayer and the six perfections? And when I think of pure prayer, I think of heartfelt prayer. Geshe Lama Kunchok said, taking refuge from the lips is useless. We have to take refuge from the heart. So... We take refuge in the triple gem. We take refuge in this mind of enlightenment. And we take refuge in the fact that we can reach enlightenment. So many people don't really believe that. But with practice, we see, I think those who have been practicing for some years now can look back and say, yes, there's been some change in my mind, some change. Worthwhile change, right? Worthwhile. <laughs> so the Buddha told his followers, this is how it appears to me. But you must examine, you must investigate, you must explore, and you must analyze how it is that the mind fabricates its experience of the world. The mind fabricates its experience of the world. Is that true? What does that mean? What does that mean? So this is the purpose. This is the purpose of meditation, is to see the true nature of our mind and how it is that it fabricates our world. You see, it doesn't matter whether we live in Santa Fe or Nepal or in a high-rise apartment in New York City or in a forest in Boulder Creek, California. As long as we are under the control of karma and delusion, our address is samsara. So what does it mean to be under the control of karma and delusion? Karma, really, uh, the word in Tibetan is lay, and it just means action. So it means action of body, speech, and mind. And we talk about the 12 links 
what causes this merry-go-round of pain, we start with a misperception. We start with ignorance. And because of that misperception, that delusion, we create actions. And those actions plant seeds on our mental continuum. And they ripen. And a feeling arises, positive, negative, or neutral. We want more of the positive and less of the negative. And we grow that craving into grasping. And there becomes an irresistible urge to have that thing or to be free of that thing we don't want. And that urge pushes us into becoming. That becoming at the time of death is a new rebirth followed by old age, sickness, and death. And we do it again and again and again. But it's not just life to life. It's moment to moment. And this is what we begin to see, this subtle impermanence that's taking place moment to moment as we sit. People say, oh, my mind is so busy. I sit down, I can't meditate because, no, I can't meditate. My mind is too full. My, I can't stop my thoughts. That's not the purpose of meditation, to stop your thoughts. As a matter of fact, Milarepa said, you can't stop your thoughts, even if you try to put them in an iron box. Thoughts come. They arise, they abide, and they pass. But we get caught by them and we follow them down their little path until we realize, oh, and we come back. And then once again, there's the thought that grabs us. The juicy thoughts, they just take us right away. That's normal. So the point is for us to cultivate stable attention, cultivate our concentration, because it is true that we can direct our attention. We can direct our attention to, let's say, the breath. We can say, now I want you to go to the tip of your nose and to Notice the sensation as the air flows in and out. So we go there. But it doesn't take very long until the bird chirps and it reminds us of the walk we took and the person we were with who reminds us of that friend and we're down the rabbit hole into a whole story. So what the point of of developing our concentration is to be able to stay on the topic, to be able to cultivate a mind that is at peace, that can watch, that can see what is appearing without being hooked, allowing it, simply allowing. The great Tilopa told Naropa, he said, Let's see if I can get it exactly right. Don't feed or strangle what appears. Just take it as it comes. And when there's no more to grasp or to let go, you are released into Mahamudra, this clear, spacious mind. But it doesn't come by the by. Concentration does not come by the by. It doesn't come on its own. Buddha said, I've shown you the path to enlightenment, the path to freedom, but you should know that freedom depends on you. It requires practice. And I know how difficult it is to establish a sustained daily practice. 
through busy lives and through sitting on through boredom, you know, through physical discomfort, perhaps. I know that it is difficult, but the rewards are vast because eventually we come to see our meditation practice in the same light as brushing our teeth. We wouldn't even consider a day without it. It becomes part of who we are and what we do and becomes the most important thing in our life. So how do we get to that place where it becomes that? And that's the four thoughts that turn the mind to practice. And I know you know what they are because you've all studied the Lam Rim. You know them. You know that it's having this precious human life and how rare it is. But do you think about it? Do you wake up in the morning and go, wow, I have another day. Thich Nhat Hanh has a beautiful prayer. It's, uh, I wake up this morning and smile. 24 brand new hours are before me. I vow to live fully in each moment and to look upon all beings with eyes of compassion. If we can inculcate these prayers so that they come naturally, so that when you put your feet on the floor in the morning, that's what rises in your mind. Wow, I have another day to practice. That's practice is not just on the cushion. You know, practice is throughout our day. For many years, I had a business. And I got up in the morning and I went to work. And I ran a business. And my practice was on the trail walking from my house to my car, reciting some prayers that I had committed to recite. Succession Guru Yoga for one. And my mantras that I had said I would say. But I didn't do cushion practice. <clears throat> It was a time in my life. I had three, ch three children and, and I was the chief cook and bottle washer. So I was busy. I lived long enough to be able to retire from that and uh, when Venerable Yarpel and I, the, the karma for our marriage finished, um, I was meeting with Venerable Rene, and he said, you should do three months retreat every year. And I laughed, you know, I was having dinner with him and I laughed and I said, how would I do that? You know, I have a business, you know, I'm sitting on three boards. I have these, my children were mostly grown then. Uh, and he said, okay, he said, at least one month. That was very skillful. Because then I thought, oh, one, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could do a one. I said, but how would I do that? He said, you tell someone. You, know, you set a time. You think of a time in the future when you can do a one-month retreat. The best time of the year to do a one-month retreat for you. And you tell someone that you're going to do a one-month retreat. So I thought about it. I thought, okay, here. The only way I could do a one month retreat would be if my manager would say it was okay. So I went to work and I told her, I said, I said, dear, I'm thinking about doing a one month retreat in January. I figured she'd say no way. And then I'd be off the hook. <laughs> but she said, okay. She said, if you do these things, you know, I was, it was a graphic design business service. So we had clients and there were services to be done. She said, if you do these, we can handle the rest of it. So this was June, I think, or May. And I thought, okay. But then uh, her name was Renee. Renee went to the bank. I, Boulder Creek is a very small town. And when you own a business in downtown Boulder Creek, most, a lot of people know you and the bank manager knows you and the tellers know you. So Renee went to the bank and she told him I was going to do a one month solitary retreat in January. <laughs> I 
And I went to the bank and they said, wow, we heard. <laughs> Can you imagine? So that's it. So I did. I did a one month retreat in January. And after coming out of that retreat, and um, it was a it was a wonderful experience for me. And I went to the bank and the manager came up and said, how was it? And I said, you know, it was really good. She said, you going to do it again in January? <laughs> I said, well, you know, probably. <laughs> so it became known, you know, that nobody asks Elaine to do anything in January because she's in retreat. So for 20 years, every January, I did a one month retreat. And um, I remember hearing, a, I think it was a Christian minister. It was some kind of talk that he was giving. And he said, the Sabbath is a day of rest. We should not work on the Sabbath. It should be a day of rest and prayer. And he said, you put it in your calendar, you know, so that no one, you know, somebody calls up and says, we're having a party on Sunday, you know, come on over. And you let me check my calendar. No, I have a date with my ex. That's what he said. I thought oh, that's very clever. So in that way, because I habituated the community and my family, that in January, I do a retreat. Everybody expects it. And then I do it. And it's very worthwhile. And I did it. I'm telling you this because I think it's possible to do a retreat once a month on a weekend. You can pick the third weekend. I can do a retreat from a full day on Saturday. I can do Friday night, go in. Saturday, do the full day with four sessions, and Sunday, have a lovely breakfast and, and dedicate, you see, at noon. So the way to do that is to put it in your calendar and tell someone. <laughs> <laughs> and my recommendation, because we, don't, we may not be together again because this is one of those in and out kind of things. My recommendation is that you start with the Lam Rim and one, one month, the first month, you do the first. The second month, you do the second. So the first month you, you do, the first one, you do only precious human rebirth. You might do that for six months. Meditate on the precious human rebirth and grow your concentration because it is the preciousness of this human life that we think, wow, you know, I've got something really special here. I better use it. And the second one is death and impermanence. And how many of you thought pretty sure that you were going to die this afternoon? No, we don't think like that. But we need to prepare for our death. And we prepare for our death by living a virtuous life and purifying the negative mind so that at the time of death, we're not going to be sucked down the rabbit hole of some kind of rebirth that will be unhelpful. So we, we meditate on this precious human life. We meditate on death and impermanence. We meditate on karma, how karma works. And we meditate on the suffering of cyclic existence. Because I would venture to say that all of us live a pretty comfortable life. We have a nice home. We have enough food to eat, nice clothes, drive a nice car, good friends, entertainment, you know, we have what might be called a pleasurable life. So we don't look, as Jason Kappa said, bless me to see all that's wrong with the seemingly good things of this life. 
I can never get enough of them. They cannot be trusted. They're the door to every pain I have. Grant me then to strive instead for the happiness of freedom. But we do think that our happiness is somehow out there. And until we can really find inner happiness, inner peace, we're still looking for it out there. But once we have inner peace, once we have this contentment, then there's not a lot of grasping for the next iPhone, the next good movie, the new restaurant that opened in town, the many different joys that we experience. It doesn't mean that we don't enjoy. Lama said, you should enjoy as much as possible, dear, without grasping. It's recognizing that everything, the good and the bad, are impermanent. And therefore not grasping. So, um, <laughs> I want to do a meditation, except I have a cramp in my leg. Excuse me. Um, and I think maybe, maybe people, I don't know if people need to stand up. It seems that I do. You know, there are considered two or three, depending on how you look at it, kinds of meditation. So there's review meditation, where you are going over the points. When you do a Lam Rim retreat on the precious human life, you go over the eight freedoms and the ten richnesses, and you you review them and you review them until you have them memorized, right? So you do a review meditation, but you need concentration in order to be able to do that. The second is an analytical meditation where you're actually analyzing, you know, having you put it front and center and you have a debate with it. Or you're analyzing some aspect. And the third is placement meditation, this one pointed placing the mind on an object and encouraging it to stay there. So this particular meditation that I want to do now is more of an analytical meditation. It'll be using our imagination. Buddha said, right? We need to analyze how it is that the mind fabricates its experience of the world. We need to analyze that. We need to figure that out. How does that happen? So there's a prescription for meditating, a way to get into the meditation, the posture, the attitude. For me, uh, I begin by making offerings setting up my room and making water bowl offerings on my altar. And when I do that, I have a stick of incense because that's the method for preparing water bowls. And I offer the incense to each of my lamas and all of the holy images that are in my room. I happen to be fortunate enough to have a, a bedroom turned into a gompa. So <laughs> that's my cave. I recommend a cave, if even it's a closet or uh, behind a shoji screen, a place that's, that's your place that you can go to. And uh, so having a sacred space that begins to be imbued with uh, some sort of quality because you're, you're imbuing it with that, you know, ultimately it's empty, right? But as I go into my gompa and I see, I make these offerings and I have this stick of incense and I look at the face of my lamas, 
I don't have, uh, I made a list once if in three year retreat, I made a list, I had 42 teachers. Wow. Maybe I just heard them one lecture, you know, but 42 of them. Not all Tibetan Buddhist, not all monks or nuns, you know, lay people as well. But so I don't have all of their pictures there, but I have my, my root lamas there. And I allow myself to think about all of these teachers that I have and my good fortune. So that is what happens to me. As I walk in, I have this sense of gratitude. This is what we conjure. How do we conjure gratitude? By thinking of the benefit of having met this Dharma. Without it, we're chasing our tail, isn't it? So I do that. Then I make prostrations. Uh, sometimes I do the 35 Buddha prostration practice. And then I sit. <laughs> Usually I'll have a cup, a hot cup of something and I'll have a read for a page of something that I am studying or reading. And I just read a little bit while I'm having something to drink. And then in order to settle into meditation, I find my meditation posture. So this, we all, you know the seven points, right? So the, the legs are crossed or the feet are flat on the floor. And if you're sitting in a chair, it's useful to have maybe a cushion under your feet so that your thighs are level and there's not a pressure on the back of your legs, but they're just out nicely nestled on a cushion. If you're tall enough, maybe your legs don't dangle. <laughs> you don't need, you don't need. I usually put a cushion under my feet if I'm sitting in a chair. And then the hands resting gently in the lap and I have, I have a little cushion because I want my hands to rest. And because I have pain in my joints, I can't sit in the way to have the thumbs touching. Uh, I have to let them rest. So the left hand, the wisdom hand, cradles the method hand and the thumbs touch. They can touch either together or they can touch resting. And the most important aspect is the spine is straight. So we sit in a posture of dignity. This allows for the energy to flow through the central channel, through the side channels, and will ultimately be very important when one engages in practices that address that central channel. And you will find that the way I lead meditations, when it is using guru yoga, we will always dissolve the guru into our heart. We will always bring the guru down through the center of our body. For me, this is exercising the central channel. And it's something that uh, I feel doesn't matter where we are on the spectrum of meditation, whether we're just beginning or whether we're doing high practices, then still this bringing the energy in, in gathering the energy. This is what I remember reading. Teresa of Avila said, this is meditation. It is an in gathering of our attention. So we have this posture of dignity. I lift the shoulders and let them fall. So I see that I'm not holding them up with tension. My chin is tucked ever so slightly. 
My tongue rests on my upper palate and my jaws, my teeth are not tight. My, they're slightly separated. And my eyes are depending, could be closed, could be slightly open to allow light to come in, could be wide open. Depends on the meditation. So I establish my meditation posture. And I set my motivation. Thinking of the three levels of refuge. And thinking, just as I long for happiness and freedom from suffering, so too does every living being. My friends, the troublemakers in my life, all those strangers that I have yet to meet, I surround myself with them. And I think, I'm going to lead them in this meditation. And I begin by ingathering my attention, by establishing relaxation, stillness, and vigilance. And I make a strong determination right now, for this amount of time, I will remain present, resting in momentary present awareness. And I bring my awareness to the crown of my head. In order to establish relaxation, I allow it to float down through the center of my body, checking my brow and around my eyes, letting them soften. I come to my jaw. Relax it. Actually, I allow a little smile. Just gentle. Letting it float down into my neck. And across my shoulders. Like a warm, loving light. It goes down my arms, past my elbows, my wrists, and all the way to my fingertips. And I allow it to release and nurture any places that could use some loving energy. I bring it back to the nape of my neck and begin to float down my upper torso. I shine it around my shoulder blades, my upper back, and into my chest. I let it come down to the small of my back. And I release my belly, let it spread, let it be soft to receive the full breath. Not holding any tension in the solar plexus. Releasing. Coming all the way down to my sit bones past my hips, giving them some energy. My glutes are soft.
I take the energy down my thighs, past my knees. I give them some love. Down my calves, my ankles, all the way to the soles of my feet and the tips of my toes. I check. Is every cell of my body relaxed? How does that feel? How's my mind? I feel the places where my body touches the cushion, the seat, the floor. And I allow a sense of stability to be present. Well held in the arms of Mother Earth. Safe. I feel the breath in my body. There is a harmony between the movement and the stillness. The body breathes. With no preference for long or short. No force or impedance. Simply allowing the breath to flow as it will. And knowing, knowing when I breathe out, and when I breathe in again. Fine tuning my awareness. I direct my attention to the sensation at one point, at the tip of the nose, wherever it manifests most distinctly. And I count 10 cycles, breathing in and out as one. And I notice the change in sensation. I know when the breath turns. For 10 cycles, 
in silence. Attend to just to the sensation of the breath as it flows in and out. And with this relaxed, still, peaceful mind, I invite you to join me in a meditation using our imagination. Imagine, if you will, a small woodland stream, fresh and freely flowing. The small stream bubbles and crisscrosses past the boulders and exposed roots on its banks. It flows over the rocks and the stones on its uneven bed making a lovely babbling sound. There is an uneven rock ledge jutting out a bit from the water, just enough to create a little waterfall as the stream drops over it. As the water rushes over the ledge, some of it is pushed to the side of the stream below, toward the bank. It gives rise to a small eddy in an indentation of the bank. Imagine the eddy there, circling around and around, remaining fixed in its position. It then becomes backwater while the water of the rest of the stream flows by. Inside the circle of the eddy, the circular movement continues its swirl going round and round, over and over 
and over. Its momentum concentrates and moves inward to the pattern of circling. Imagine that its attention turns away from the fresh and freely flowing stream and is drawn into the central force of this circular patterning. The eddy is defined by the circular pattern. Imagine too that as the eddy, it identifies itself inside its circular boundary as something, as something separate from the freely flowing stream. We can imagine that with this identification, the eddy checks its circular motion well and often. Monitoring it carefully to circle well, to remain in the comfort of the familiar. It compares itself to neighboring eddies, judging and evaluating. It sees itself as separate, as independent, as needing to be protective of its own circularity. It comes to cherish its swirling, the dynamic that creates its tiny universe. It comes to cherish all the debris caught within the swirls with a sense of personal reference about each of the particles trapped inside its muddy orbit. These are mine. Its view becomes myopic. It forgets all about the ancient mountain down which the stream flows. It forgets the centuries of melting snows and summer rains that create the stream. It forgets the massive tree roots and the rutted animal paths that determine the course of the stream as it flows down the sloped terrain through the woods. It forgets all about the small ledge of stone that carries the waterfall above it. It forgets all the immeasurable causes and conditions that give rise to its appearance. Not looking, ignoring, the eddy assumes itself according to its ignorance. It ignores that its pattern never for a moment holds the same water. It doesn't look and it doesn't see that in each new moment, new water is recruited into the familiar circling pattern. holding itself as eddy only, as an isolated phenomenon, it remains ignorant of the fact that nothing exists independently of the conditions giving rise to it. That all of life leads to each arising.
it loses sight of its inseparability from the fleeting stream and squirrel and mountain and cloud and wind and planet and galaxy. It's a mere snapshot of a moment in cosmic time. Unaware, not looking, it ignores its fragile impermanence. A fox or a deer could cross upstream at any moment, dislodging a waterlogged branch, changing the course of the stream. The eddy would be gone in an instant, leaving no trace in the water as if it were never there. Unaware, not looking, the eddy clings to the circled fabrication. It ignores its essential nature, never realizing that its separation from the flowing water is only imagined. It fabricates its experience of the world. And like the eddy, our mind fabricates our experience of the world. Oh, am I like the eddy, trapped, circling round and round, a single point on an ever-flowing stream, limiting the infinite possibilities of emptiness? Hmm. Buddha said we must understand how the mind fabricates our world, our experience of our world. For many years, I didn't know what that actually meant. First, we learn intellectually. And then experientially, we see how it is that everything comes from mind. So if I had a little bell, I would ding it. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Comments? I think the um, illustration of the Eddy being separate and you know, feeling that separateness and independence and permanence really helps, you know, yeah. as opposed to me being, because I feel like I'm independent, but when you see it in the light of the eddy in the water and how it can change and how my life can change in a minute, right? I'm just spinning around like that. So I, I like that analogy. This meditation comes from a book called Unbinding by Kathleen Dowling Singh. Uh, she wrote Grace in Aging as well. And I was introduced to her at a book club. I belong to a book club with, there are seven of us, all from the same Bajapani beginnings. And we get together well, for everybody's birthday. 
so we're all old. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> and we read Grace in Aging together. Uh, it's a very, very good book. And then Unbinding. Unbinding, I found to be quite profound. It is actually uh, a secular description of the 12 links of dependent origination, how we actually create, how we fabricate our experience of the world, how it happens. I can highly recommend that book. I, I really find it quite fascinating. So how about the, the meditation, to getting, getting into meditation? What's your habit? Do you have a habit for your meditation practice? Mm -hmm. It's okay, we're all friends. <laughs> I'm trying to lose the object, trying to concentrate on it. And before, so you just sit down and you bring the object before you and you bring and you concentrate. Try breath and object, yeah. Sure. It's kind of and it changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you don't first establish posture, oh, relaxation, yes. no. breath, and then bring the object. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I find is that sometimes I have an agenda following the meditation. Right? I'm going somewhere. I have something to do. So there's an idea that I have to hurry up and do the meditation. Oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do that too. So, yeah. so it's super important for me to relax and just say, okay, this is, this is what I'm doing now. Otherwise, counting to 10 breaths, I'm gonna hurry up and breathe, you know, get them done. I've, I've watched that happen, see. I watch happen to, to, to finish the meditation instead of being in the meditation. Hmm? Yeah. So this idea of how it is that we create our experience of the world. If it was true that our experience of the world was real, then my experience of the world would be exactly like yours. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. well, why is it that our experiences are different? But where does it come from? Yeah, okay, so it comes from your mind. So it's thoughts coming in the mind that produce, you know, first there's the thought and then there's the action, right? First there's the thought, then there's the word and the deed. But why this thought? Anybody? <laughs> From our previous lives? Previous I mean, lives, I'm okay. Not, I mean, I have not past life, I mean, previous in this life. In this life. So, precisely. And could say also past lives, if you're uh, prone to believe in past lives. But not, even if you're not, Talopa said, view the mind as having no thought other than repetition. Oh, wow. Can you imagine? <laughs> so why does it keep coming? Jared? <laughs> Thank you. 
So if you remember something, let's say something that was painful, you had a painful experience and that memory comes, what causes it to come again? Because it's painful to think about, to revisit it. What causes it to come again? Perpetuation. Yes, we're habituated to have it come again. But why? What causes the habituation? Attachment or? Grasping. Grasping. Attachment. Good. Yes. Familiarity. Familiarity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Feeling. Say again. Feeling. 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 A feeling about it. Exactly. It comes. And the bigger the feeling, the more we grasp. The more we want to be free of it if it's difficult. Or the more we want to enjoy it. I remember when I was first attending teachings in the 70s, 80s, and I would get bored. So I would, um, I would do a fantasy about remodeling the house or, or getting some uh, winning the lottery and where I would give that money away, all these different places. In the, in the meditation, I would do that too because I couldn't. I didn't know what I was doing and I, I would just make up stories. That's a complete waste of time. It's a yeah. total waste of time. <clears throat> but until we actually recognize what we're doing, until we see what we're doing and that we don't have to do that, we will continue to do it because as you say, it's habit, it's attachment, it's familiarity. It's the feelings that come from that particular thing. Now, I think in our life, we have had positive and negative feelings that don't charge us anymore. They come again, you know, the thought of the event comes again but it doesn't have much feeling associated with it. Why would that be? We don't give it the power we want to say. We don't give it the power. We don't attend to it in the way and revisit it in the same way to conjure that same feeling it causes the knot in the pit of our stomach to come again. You see, this is what Buddha taught us. He taught us a path to cut through that. I visited with a dear friend of mine, longtime friend of mine, who may be here this afternoon. She's a resident teacher at Upaya Zen Center. And she's also was founder of Diamond Light Tibetan Buddhist Center in Sacramento. So she has a long history of Tibetan Buddhism and Zen. From the time she was very small, she was attracted to spiritual life. So we visited last night and she was talking about, she's only been at Upaya Center for, I don't know, a few months. And uh, so it was, she said, we have to come all the way to Santa Fe to see one another. I haven't seen her since before COVID. <laughs> So we visited it, and she was telling me about her, her role as teacher at Upaya and, and how the center is going. And I reflected on that because she said, you know, I think the world is traumatized. The whole world is traumatized. There's trauma everywhere. People are really suffering in, in ways that maybe haven't been so visible before. And so I asked her, I said, you know, how do you, when someone comes to you with their trauma, their story of trauma, you know, 
how do you, what kind of advice do you give? And she said, this is so beautiful. I can't believe I don't remember the Roshi's name. Um, Roshi Joan? Joan, Joan, yes, yes. Joan Halifax, yes, I know Joan, but you know, the names, they're the first to go. So, so she said, she has two beautiful things to say. One is be with, and the other is walk alongside. So in other words, it's more a listening. It's being able to be with and to walk alongside. And I thought that was really beautiful because I said, you know, because both of us have been teachers and, and it's very hard for me not to give advice. To say, well, you, know, you did this, 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 this. And she said, the same is true of her. She, said she, wants, she says, I can, you know, go on and on and on about this and that and the other, but um, it's more difficult to be with to walk alongside because each one of us have wisdom and our wisdom will bubble up if we're allowed to let it. So I told her, I said, you know, I think Zen is hard. I think it's hard because you have to be with and walk alongside, but you can't, Where's the tool to, to transform it mm-hmm. right now? How can I think about it differently to analyze it and work differently <laughs> with it? And I believe that that is the power of Tibetan Buddhism and Lama Tsongkhapa's beautiful path to enlightenment, taking all of the Buddhist teachings and putting them succinctly in a way that we can actually use those to transform our mind in the moment. So when we have these feelings that come, as soon as we have contact, you see a feeling arises, positive, negative, or neutral. It happens. So whether we grasp at the feeling or not, This is a a portal for stepping off the wheel. To step off the wheel. To get off the merry-go-round. So the feeling arises. And wanting begins. I want more or I want less. I'm feeling confused because mm-hmm. two weeks ago we had a vendor here who mm-hmm. made a suggestion that works really well that when some feeling comes mm-hmm. up to drop an emptiness which I don't have access to, but yes, mm-hmm. third eye can walk into and feel it. And can do? Yeah. Can do? And it neutralizes. Yes. Because that is emptiness, because when you walk into it, you can't find it. (laughs) If you go into that, you are actually, it, it, it does dissolve, you know, exactly. That's a very good. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's beautiful. Yes. Perfect. Exactly. Perfect. Exactly perfect. But the feeling does arise and the the wanting to do something about it. No, that's just going into it and feeling it. You recognize the feeling. Yeah, and rather than rather than allowing oneself to push away or go toward, you simply be with. Yes. Yes. It's very powerful. Yes, that's very good. That really is the emptiness of it, isn't it? Yes. Exactly. Because the nature of the mind 
is empty, spacious, and pure. Mm -hmm. And if you go into a feeling that is arising, so let's say uh, fear, or pick a feeling. Lust, desire. Desire. It does, it does. Yes, you just see it, but you see it has no essence. You see, that's what happens, that when you feel, when you go looking, you go looking, because the mind is empty. The feeling is empty. It only becomes something when we feed it, when we give it energy. Thoughts need energy to survive. Exactly. Just being. Yeah. Just allowing. Yes. That's. Thank you for that. That's really good. That's. That's. Uh, that's really good. You know how all of what you were saying is meant to go back and forth with what you're saying. It's. That's very. There are. This is a. That is a beautiful mind training. That's one. There are so many possibilities, and depending on an individual. One thing works, and something else works. So then I'll, I'm going to have a question. Please. I'm an intuitive feeler. Mm -hmm. I'm not an intuitive feeler. Mm -hmm. It's quite hard for me to feel. So it's easier for me not to go off on a tangent. Sure. Great. And go off on a tangent. Perfect. It's much easier for me to stay with the feeling and experience. Perfect. But Yes, yes, true. But when you can, when you can feel, when you can uh, intuit, when you can come to the ground, the groundless ground, because there is no ground either. But when you can come to that space of vast open awareness of being able to feel that, then everything dissolves. It's, it's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you see, the intellectual is to get the information to be able to understand it. But we have to go beyond the words into the experience. So they say the four reliances, you know, don't rely on the person, rely on their words. Don't rely on the words, rely on the meaning. And don't rely on the, just the, uh, mm, what do they call it? The prescriptive meaning, rely on the experiential meaning. So all of it, they're all pointing to the same place. All of it. And each, each bit can touch a different person. You know, a different mind will say, okay, yeah, I can use that. And this mind can use that. But it all comes to the same space, the same place, which we can touch when we're still. You know, the power is in the pause. And when we can then identify with that as our true home, we can abide in that. And we can then, when we can then, we have the power at that time to be able to fabricate our experience of the world in a positive way, to accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative, you know? <laughs> Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> So this, this is the power of meditation. To go into it, to pause, to, and you go right into it and right through it. And you come out. I mean, I don't, you know, it's like now that I have tools, that's easy. Boom. Then I'm happy. I mean, you know. Sure. We already sit and do it, but 
up sitting and things come up as they do all the time. That's right. And that is emptiness, my dear. It has no, no nature, no self-nature. And then, and then you look at that point. When you go right through it, you look. Oh, you might say, you know, where was that? Where did that, who, who had that? Slowly you begin to dissolve. You dissolve oneself, you dissolve the other, and you dissolve what's in between. You see, it all dissolves. And it just... Exactly. Exactly. The hatred dissolves. You see, the mind training, training oneself to love your enemy. You think, oh, you know, I could start with politicians. You know, I could bring, and I do, I bring them right here. And I think of them, and I think just as I have Buddha nature, so too do they. So then when, and I have to do it regularly when I'm triggered by things that are said, or things I see, the harm that's being done. So I have to bring that to mind in order to walk right into it, you know, go right through it and see just like me, just like me. But through the power of ignorance, trapped in habituated mind, trapped. So they're trapped. Without choice, they circle without choice. You know, habituated mind just keeps spewing. And it's pitiful because there's no happiness. No happiness. So it's 12 o'clock. We're supposed to quit now, right? <laughs> we can meditate on it. <laughs> So I think maybe a brief dedication in case we don't make it back to our cushion. Always remembering that uh, death can come at any moment. And the most important thing in my life is to grow my love, my compassion, my wisdom, and my great joy. And to share that with everyone I meet. So I want to dedicate to being able to do that and dedicate it to all the spiritual masters who are teaching these paths to enlightenment. May their long lives be fruitful. Yes, and to those who are no longer with us in the physical plane, those I know who have passed away recently, may they have fortunate rebirths or those holy ones return and guide us. Sudoku, thank you for your attention and your kind participation. It's good. You know, we learn from one another. So what do you Elaine? <laughs> I hear you saying, Elaine, and I'm going to be right with you, but I'm going to answer this question. What do I do when I'm... Uh -huh. How do I manage? Oh, I have other people with me all the time in my mind. I fill my room with people. Before I went into three-year retreat, I made a long list of everyone I could think of in my life. And I typed it up. I centered it in lines and then I printed it on pieces of parchment paper and glued them together and put a dowel at the bottom and made a scroll and I hung it above my altar. These are the people that I'm doing retreat for. Mm -hmm. And then for and with, and then anytime anybody came into mind that wasn't on that list because you know it took a while to make that list, I hand wrote it on. So I surround myself by 
people. Mm-hmm. And they're very real to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Who called my name? Elaine, it's it's Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Just he, we in Zoom land, um, when there's dialogue in the Gompo, I can hear you, but I'm I'm not able to hear the other participant. Um, oh, yikes! And, and it's it seems so like profound. There was, yes, I could tell that. I could hear you, but so just a reminder for maybe this afternoon. Thank you, Barbara. I will do my best. I will do my best to remember. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you all very much. And I hope to see you when? 1.30. Oh, 1.30. 1.30. 1.30. Okay, 1.30. See you at 1.30. Mount